Back when it was first announced, Mary Skelter immediately caught my eye. It was a stark contrast to what Compile Heart had put out up until that point, and instead seemed to focus on what appeared to be a dark and much more somber affair. Now the story is set in a living and breathing jail that was rumoured to have swallowed an entire city that used to reside on the surface. Lurking throughout the complex are demonic creatures that were once humans or animals, but have now been altered by the jail's sinister corruption. This is where the player is introduced to Jack and Alice, two humans who have been locked away after being captured by these demons, who possess the power to gain corruption from the blood that they absorb from enemies. Now it's essentially a dungeon crawler that sees you traversing through a huge variety of levels, as you come across treasure and various obstacles like traps and enemies. Of course, the main attraction is the combat system, which is surprisingly deep and more robust than anything Compile Heart have offered before. They can attack, use a skill, defend, and escape from combat and must take into consideration the enemy's weakness that is based on elements. By using the right skill, inflicting a critical attack or overkilling an enemy, you will start to fill a blood spatter gauge. Once the gauge is full, the blood maiden enters massacre mode. This provides a nice stat bonus across the board. Outside of those tricks, the combat is simple to understand but as addictive as this genre tends to be. It's by no means one of the best RPGs on the system and with an asking price of $120, it's a pretty hard bargain for those who don't collect. If you have a modded Vita though, this one is well worth a download, especially for those not willing to spend that kind of money on a game. At first glance, Unmetal looks like a love letter to the early Metal Gear games on the MSX, and its early stealth-based gameplay which would become a staple for the series. While Unmetal is definitely inspired by Metal Gear, it's a strange, tongue-in-cheek game that has some genuinely funny humour and addictive gameplay. It sees you taking on the role of one Jesse Fox, who was in prison for a crime that he did not commit. The narrative plays out with Jesse actually telling the story after the fact, and follows him in the events that took place during the a mission that would see him apprehended. Now when it comes to gameplay, it's almost as much of an adventure game as it is an action game. While you have to take out enemies using stealth, you also have to find items, combine them to make new items, and complete tasks for characters you'll meet along the way. There are obstacles that require items to bypass, and these sometimes even employ a bit of logic usually found in point and click adventures, as progressing sometimes requires using your items in unexpected and humorous ways. If you're at all a fan of Metal Gear, Unmetal is bound to provide some fun and although its humour might not be to everyone's tastes, there's no denying that it's a solid gameplay experience. For a copy on the PlayStation Vita, you're looking at around $140, but luckily Unmetal is releasing very soon on several other platforms that will make it easier for those who want to play it to get their hands on it without having to pay over the odds. Super Meat Boy is the spiritual successor to an online flash game called Meat Boy. Meat Boy was released on cult gaming and humour website Newgrounds many, many years ago, but it wasn't until its sequel that it would see a release on home and portable consoles. Now Super Meat Boy follows a very simple storyline. You play as Meat Boy, a red square with pixels for eyes and a very animate mouth and small limbs. His girlfriend, Bandage Girl, has been kidnapped by the main antagonist, Dr. Fetus, so it's up to you to make your way through 300 levels in order to save her. It's essentially a 2D platformer with a huge emphasis upon speed and thanks to the incredibly tight controls, you'll be jumping, sliding, running and dragging yourself against walls in no time. Because the control you have over Meat Boy is so intricate, there can be no blaming the game for failure. If you fail, it's quite simply your fault. And that's quite frustrating in some ways, because this game is hard. It's very hard. Team Meat clearly worked on making this game fun to play but also challenging. As I mentioned, there's 300 levels, but completing the first 40 is in some ways a challenge itself. It is largely a game of trial and error. You're supposed to die, and die a lot. Dying is only half the fun, because once you beat a level, especially later on, it's an incredible achievement. Super Meat Boy is hands down one of the most enjoyable platformers out there. If you're looking to nab a physical copy of the game on the Vita, due to its limited run like many of these games on this list, be prepared to pay upwards of a hundred and seventy five dollars. I didn't know what to expect when I first started playing V. From the various screenshots and footage I'd seen, I assumed it was going to be some sort of Metroidvania, and although it does clearly take inspiration from those type of games, it manages to carve out its own identity, mainly due to one simple mechanic. In V, you can't jump. 
Instead, you flip gravity. And whilst you're flipping, you can move right and left. What this does is that it forces you to not only focus on the floor, but on the whole room, since you'll be floating in the middle of it most of the time, while you're only changing gravity. With this mechanic, V becomes a platformer of unique design, yet the game does not hide behind this gimmick, but actively evolves its use many times over. Now the main campaign is split up into five areas that are all separated by an overworld that can be freely explored. The catch is that each of these five areas present a completely different concept from the last. No two dungeons feel the same, however each does its utmost to fling you into spikes, non-sentinel enemies, or both at the same time. In fact, death by spikes is a regular occurrence in V. Death will come by the hundreds, luckily checkpoints are aplenty, and each challenge can be achieved with enough practice or some luck. Ultimately, the game for most people will be a matter of trial and error, but this is never monotonous due to the excellent checkpoint system. Now visually, there's only so much you can do with retro style graphics. You only have so many colours and pixels to work with, but it's games like these that continue to prove that all the bells and whistles in the world are not going to enhance the gameplay experience. Thanks to its incredibly addictive hook, V's rather basic presentation just fades right into the background. Overall, V is a solid title and well and truly deserves a pickup, but if you're looking for a physical copy, be prepared to spend upwards of $200 for the privilege. A Rose in the Twilight is a rather unique platformer that all centers around a little girl known as Rose. As she awakens, she finds herself in an old castle lost in time and without color. She's not alone though, Rose soon finds a faceless giant that accompanies her as they attempt to find a way out of the castle. The main issue played in their escape however is that Rose carries with her a curse. It manifests as several fawns and a single rose growing around her body. Now the narrative is primarily told through a series of vignettes that are located just off the main path in many of the stages that make up the adventure. Most of them cover Rose's backstory which can at times be rather playful and endearing, while in other cases, these short sequences can be kind of tragic. On the gameplay front, Rose's curse gives her a unique gift. She can drain the colour from objects and store it in the rose on her back. This allows her to fill other objects with the red that she currently holds. Control can also be switched to the giant which has super strength and can walk through fawn covered areas completely unharmed. The giants can pick up red objects or rows and throw them to out of reach areas or across large gaps. Working together, they'll both solve puzzles and escape from a number of dangerous situations. Although early on the difficulty isn't that much of an issue, as you progress it slowly ramps up, to the point where there's quite a bit of precision and timing involved. It can become a bit frustrating, but it's nothing that takes away from the game as a whole. A Rose in the Twilight is a really interesting puzzle game that properly utilizes each character's specific ability and uses its aesthetic to highlight key points of interest while setting a specific mood. The way everything ties back into the narrative that the game is trying to tell is done really well and makes for an incredible journey. If you're a collector and are on the lookout for a physical version, you can expect to pay upwards of $240 for a copy. Breach and Clear is a tactics game that is largely split into two separate phases. The first phase is where you command your units where to move, where to face, and what to do much like any turn-based strategy game out there. The second phase plays out your decisions in real time as the consequences of your actions reveal themselves. Tactics are easy to pull off and the simplicity of it is never an issue, but rather it's the lack of some fine tuning in the mechanics that ultimately let it down. Initially, soldiers can be placed individually or by groups at various points. There are four methods of breaching to choose from, door kick, lock pick, shotgun breach and explosives. There are seven squads to choose, from joint task force to spetsnaz, which all consist of four team members. Each of them can be fully customized both visually and more importantly when it comes to their abilities. There are six different classes in total, which naturally all possess their own distinct advantages and disadvantages on the field. As you progress through the game, your team will level up their several attributes that play a key role, such as reaction time, speed, accuracy, health, evasion and special abilities. In total, there are 35 maps, and they are all reused in the free modes which are available. Missions are rated by how fast and how little the casualties are when a map is cleared. You can earn up to 4 of these stars depending on your performance, and in turn they can be used to unlock newer weapons that can be purchased in a shop. A more varied catalogue of weapons would have been a nice inclusion, and would have helped the amount of options when it comes to taking on the enemy. By no means is this one of the 
the better tactical games out there, and with it going for nearly $250 on the PlayStation Vita, I can once again only see collectors deciding to pull the trigger on this one. Action RPGs and dating sims are two completely different beasts. There's not that many games out there that attempt to combine both of them, but one that did was AW Phoenix Fester. It tells the tale of a student trying to achieve victory in an upcoming Fester, which is a tournament where six different academies put their genes stellar against each other, which are essentially humans with superpowers. Right from the get-go, you get to choose from two characters, one being pre-made and then an option to create one entirely from scratch. Now the entire the entire game is split up into days, a lot like Persona, but with each of them being divided into two parts, and there is a finite amount of actions that can be scheduled during the day, sadly mimicking real life where unlimited time is unfortunately not yet an actual thing. On the topic of mimicking real life, one of the things the player can choose to do is work a part-time job for some extra money. These jobs are pretty easy to succeed at and generally involve combat, like testing out how much punishment a doll can take or playing the role of a bouncer to delinquent students who tend to just be running around aimlessly. You can then use this money to buy items to increase your intimacy rating and to hopefully improve your chances with the ladies. Combat is very simple but enjoyable. The battles are fought in a fairly large open space and plays much like a brawler. You have both a strong and weak basic move. The opponents like to block a lot of head-on attacks but an easy way to rectify that annoyance is to simply jump over them and attack from behind. If you're proficient enough with your weapon, you'll be capable of doing a special attack, provided you have enough points to do so. Overall, Phoenix Fester is not going to be for everyone, and will likely only appeal to an extremely small niche. But if you're looking to grab a physical copy, be prepared to pay up to $300. Invisimals began life on the PSP way back in 2010. Its unique premise that merged both the real world and game environment together helped it stand out amongst many of the games on the market at the time. Now at its core, it's an adventure game that relies upon the Vita's AR play cards and shares many similarities with the likes of Pokemon. You are tasked with finding and capturing a hundred unique Invisimals, little creatures that live in the real world via the PlayStation Vita and its AR play cards. First, you must use the cards to build structures at your base. This happens in the form of a puzzle minigame where the building is in pieces and you must use a combination of cards in the Vita's touchscreen and rear touchpad to put the pieces together within a time limit. The control setup does sound quite daunting at first, but it's actually pretty intuitive and makes good use of the Vita's unique hardware setup. Now capturing an invisible is a minigame in itself. Each of them require the player to complete specific tasks. For example, the Cyclops invisible has you playing a game of statue that sees you collect in gems by only moving when its back is turned. But the game is not just simply about capturing and nurturing. One main aspect is battling, and this is where the game excels. You'll accumulate experience points based upon the difficulty, and as you gain levels, your monsters will become more and more formidable. Fire off all of your abilities too quickly, and your invisible will become exhausted, putting you on the defensive with no option but to try and block or dodge incoming attacks. Because of this, there is a distinct amount of strategy involved with each encounter that makes each more engaging than the last. Now to grab a copy these days, it's actually quite pricey and will set you back around $300, making it one of the more expensive titles out there. Arna Surge, like many of the Vita's best offerings, is an updated port of an older title. It's a direct sequel to a game known as Surge Concerto, and it's a turn-based RPG that possesses a pretty robust combat system. It tells the story of the last human survivors of a destroyed planet, fighting for survival against a mysterious race known as the Shah. The game puts a huge emphasis on writing, even to the point where some have called it a visual novel with RPG elements, but the gameplay of Arna Surge is actually pretty interesting. Combat in Arna Surge revolves around taking out waves of enemies in a limited number of turns. If you've ever played a turn-based RPG in your life, then you should already be familiar with enemies being formed into various parties that you'll run into as you explore. In this game, you'll have to fight off an entire area's population at once, and they'll come at you one wave after the other. With a limited number of attacks per turn, you have to take out as many enemies as possible, with the goal being to wipe out the entire wave before you run out of turns. 
turns, it is possible to get bonus turns by taking out whatever enemies you attack after you're done or putting them in a break status. What this basically means is that you need to try and kill or stun certain enemies as soon as possible to keep on getting turns. Of course, some enemies will be heavily armoured or stationed way in the back. It's a really engaging system that is made up of a surprising amount of elements that help the game stand out amongst the various RPGs on the system. Graphically, for a PlayStation Vita game, Arna Surge is quite visually pleasing. The characters all look great, the areas are interesting with a lot of small details you'll find yourself investigating for no real reason, and the attacks are mostly all flashy and have an appropriate feeling of impact to them. Any fan of the genre would have fun with this one, but with an asking price of just over $300, I can't see anyone but collectors trying to get their hands on it. Some games go out of their way to do nothing but piss the player off. Others are so difficult that you'll just want to launch your console across the room and never play another game in your life, and 1001 Spikes manages to do both of these things. This game is insanely hard, it has the potential to ruin lives, but buried deep beneath its surface level of absolute pain is the constant urge to keep on going, and this is where the delicate balance between design and frustration comes to the forefront. Now the overall goal of each level is incredibly simple, you've got to find a key and take it to the door that leads to the way out. It's those bastard traps that complicate this process. Each bite sized stage is crammed full of pop up spikes, shooting darts, rotating saw blades, falling platforms and lava pits. Basically the entire game is made up of as many player killing obstacles as possible. While an adventure stuffed with as many kill traps as this one initially seems impossible, a keen eye, quick reflexes and patience the keys to success. Careful observation and planning will reveal at least one path through each challenge, but seeing the path to the exit and navigating it are two entirely different things. To make a long story short, 1001 Spikes is brutally hard, and completing even one level past the tutorial feels like a major victory. If you're on the lookout for something challenging yet highly rewarding, then 1001 Spikes is a great option. It'll likely set you back nearly $400 to grab a physical version, but thankfully it's also available on the store for a fraction of that price for those who do not collect. Well that does it for today's video, keep an eye out for the PAL territory version of this video as that will be coming up very soon, so don't forget to hit subscribe and tickle that bell. You can follow me on all of the socials to stay up to date on future videos as well and to take part in giveaways. You can also join our growing community on Discord and meet many like minded gamers to continue the conversation with. I'd like to give a special shout out to our Patreon supporters Rhino, Skill Jim, Nano, Steve, Richard, Daniel and Paddy J for their continued support that helps make these videos possible. If you're interested in joining our Discord or supporting the channel through Patreon, you'll find the links in the description. As always, thanks for taking the time to watch the video, I'll catch you in the next one.